Hi, third, fourth, and fifth grade. This is Mrs. Trenitza again with your next library lesson. Um, we have been talking with the last few lessons about reading strategies. Um, we've learned different reading strategies like summarizing, conflict and resolution, um, sequencing is the one we did last time. This time we're gonna do making inferences. Making inferences is pretty cool. Um, I enjoy doing it. It's almost like you're solving um, a little mystery. All right, so let's get started. Okay, making inferences. All right, your learning intention is that you can use strategies to help your reading comprehension. And just like I mentioned, the three that we have already learned about. Um, success is that you can complete activities that demonstrate your understanding of select reading strategies. Okay, how do good readers better understand what they read? Well, we've talked about this many times before. Um, you learn about your reading strategies, you put them into um, effect when you go to do your reading, whether you're reading something that you need to summarize, um, if you're reading something where you have to identify the conflict and the resolution, like how did they fix the problem. Sequencing is really important, like how did the story happen? What happened in the story and what order did it happen in? A lot of times that can also help you understand. And making inferences, which is what we're going to be doing today, can also help you understand what you're reading. Okay, here are two videos that I found about making inferences that I think you guys will like, and you'll understand how to do it a little bit better after watching these videos. At Grammar Songs by Melissa. What is an inference? More importantly, how can learning to make inferences make me a better reader? Let's get started. An inference is a conclusion reached on the basis of evidence and reasoning. Good readers infer by using what they already know, prior knowledge, along with clues in the text, text evidence to form an idea. Did someone say clues? Yes, Detective Waddle. Looking for clues is very important when making inferences. Let me show you. We make inferences every day in real life without even realizing it when we use the clues around us to make sense of what is happening. Stanley must be hungry. He was probably speeding. That man is scared. Tony does not like sushi. In everyday life, people combine the clues they see with their prior knowledge. Stanley always cries when he's hungry. To form an inference. Stanley is crying. He must be hungry. What inference could you make if you walked into this cafe, Detective Waddle? What clues do you see? I see party hats. I see presents. I see happy children. And I see a cake with candles. So, Detective Waddle, what inference would you make? Use the clues you see and your prior knowledge to form an idea. I know, I know, she is having a birthday party. The clues are the hats, the presents, the friends, and the cake. My prior knowledge tells me that the birthday girl is the one who will blow out the candles. My idea or inference is that she is having a birthday party. Very good, Detective Waddle. I know how to look for clues and make inferences in real life, but how can I make inferences when I read? That is an excellent question, Detective Waddle. Let me show you. When you read, you need to use the same steps your brain automatically takes when you make an inference in real life. First, you must look for clues, but now the clues are found in the text as text evidence. Then you add what you already know, your prior knowledge, to the situation at hand. Finally, you put everything together to form an idea or make an inference. Let's read a short story and look for clues to make an inference. Shelton was getting hungry. He went to the kitchen where his mom was carefully putting long thin noodles into a pot of boiling water. In another pot, she was heating red sauce. First, we need to look for clues in the text. What clues do you see? Well, Shelton was hungry. His mother put long thin noodles in boiling water and heated a red sauce. Very interesting. 
Now we need to use what we already know, our prior knowledge. But how? Well, Shelton was hungry. When I'm hungry, I want to eat. His mother was putting long thin noodles into boiling water. In another pot, there was red sauce. So she was cooking something for him to eat. Great idea. So now we just need to make an inference. We can form an idea based on the text evidence and our prior knowledge. I know, I know, spaghetti. Shelton's mother is making spaghetti. It all makes sense now. Very good, I was making spaghetti. Have some. Making inferences can be quite delicious. Let's read another short story. We will look for clues and use our prior knowledge to form an idea or make an inference. Bob came home from school one day. He happily opened the cookie jar. It was empty. He saw some crumbs leading to the living room. When he entered the room, his little sister Megan looked up at him and smiled. She had crumbs all over her face. First, we need to look for clues in the text. Detective Waddle, what clues do you see? Well, the cookie jar was empty. There were crumbs leading to the living room. Megan looked at Bob and had crumbs on her face. Very good. Now we need to use what we already know, our prior knowledge. Detective Waddle? Well, when Bob came home and found the cookie jar empty, he was disappointed. I know I feel disappointed when things don't turn out the way I planned. I also know that Bob followed a trail of crumbs to the living room where his sister Megan had crumbs on her face. I know little kids make a mess when they eat something. My prior knowledge tells me that Megan was eating something. Very good. Now put your clues and prior knowledge together to form an idea or make an inference. I know, I know. The cookie jar was empty because Megan ate all the cookies. It all makes sense. The empty jar, Megan's face, and the crumbs. <sighs> Poor Bob. Bob! Megan! I'm baking some chocolate chip cookies! Hooray! Hooray! I infer we will eat cookies today. Hooray, Detective Waddle! You did a fantastic job learning to make inferences. Thank you for joining me at Grammar Songs by Melissa. Enjoy other related videos at GrammarSongs.com. Okay, good job. So that was a good introduction to making inferences. You take what you already know, your prior knowledge or experience, plus what you see in the text, and you can add those together to infer something. So in this particular one, they were able to infer that the mom was making spaghetti because long thin noodles and red sauce, and he was hungry. And then in the other one, you could infer that the little girl ate all the cookies because the jar was empty, there was a trail of cookie crumbs from the jar to the little girl, and she had crumbs all over her face. So you can make an inference that she ate all the cookies. Okay, good job. And here is one more about making inferences. Hi friends, this lesson is all about making inferences. Our learning goal for today says, I can make inferences. Inferences, what does that mean? Well actually, we make inferences all the time. We just don't realize it. As a matter of fact, this last Saturday, my son made an inference about what we were doing for the day. See, he woke up, and I was already outside packing the car. And he said, Mama, where are we going today? I'm like, well, let's see. I need to pack an umbrella, um, some towels, a chair, and a bucket and a shovel. Those are all the things I'm going to put in the car, buddy. Do you know where we're going? And all of a sudden, his face got really bright. He ran inside and was outside a few minutes later, ready to go. Friends, we were going to the beach. Now, how did my son know that we were going to be going to the beach? Oh, that's 
right. He made an inference. When you make an inference, you think about the clues that you're given from the text or sometimes from the pictures. So you're going to look for clues like a detective. What is the author and illustrator trying to tell you? Then you're going to add that to what you already know inside your brain. And when you mix those two together, that's going to equal an inference. Just like Miles did with going to the beach. He thought about, oh, let's see, well, an umbrella. That could be for used for a couple different things. Um, but beach towels are normally used for swimming. The beach chair is normally used for when we're outside at the beach. And, of course... At that point, it was kind of like, where are we going to be going swimming? But then when he saw the shovel and the pail, which you use in the sand at the beach, he knew those are all things he had used at the beach before. So then he knew what he needed to put on. He needed to put on his bathing suit. So he took the clues that he saw, and then he added it to what he already knew. And he made an inference. We do that all the time. Can you think of any inferences you made today? Good. Very cool. All right, let's practice looking for clues in a text and adding it to what we already know to make our good inference. Mom, I need a napkin. It's melting, I yelled as I licked the sticky red juice off my fingers. Hmm, let's look for some clues in there. What is the little girl eating? She said, Mom, I need a napkin. So it's something messy. And it's something that melts. Can you think of anything that's melty that you might need a napkin for? I can think of a couple things. Then she says, I yelled as I licked the sticky red juice off my fingers. What could melt that you'd be holding in your hand that might be red and juicy when it slides down? Oh, excellent. A popsicle, of course. Yeah, a red popsicle. We use the clues and then what we already know. We already know that things that are cold melt when it's hot outside. And we know that a couple of things melt that we like to eat that's delicious, like ice cream and popsicles. But the sticky red juice, oh man, I can think of a time when I had a popsicle and it was all juicy melting down my hand. I was licking my fingers before I could get to a napkin. I used all of that information to figure out that it was for sure a popsicle. I'm good at making inferences. How did you do? Oh, good job. Let's try another one. Can we please, please go see the elephants first? They're my favorite, I said as we walked through the gate. Hmm. That's a good text. Hmm, that gives us lots of clues. Let's see. So can we please go see? So we're going to go see elephants. Well, there's only a couple places we can see elephants, especially here in Florida. Where could we see elephants here in Florida? Yeah, probably the zoo. Excellent job. They're my favorite. That means you're going to be choosing between different animals, too. So, could you go see the elephants first? They're my favorite. There's probably going to be lots of animals there. I know lots of animals are at the zoo. And that's one place where we could visit elephants. See how I took the clues from the text. The author didn't have to tell me we were at the zoo. I could just figure it out. Excellent job making an inference. All right, this one I'm going to let you try, and then you're going to tell me the answer. Are you ready? Seth grabbed a coat, boots, and an umbrella before heading outside. Okay, guys, so think about it. If you had to grab a coat and boots and an umbrella before you're heading outside, then what is it doing outside for you to have to have all three of those things? Think about it not going to be sunny outside because then you wouldn't need coat, boots, and an umbrella. So what would it be doing outside for you to need those? Let's see. Ooh, listen for these good clues. I want to know what kind of weather it is outside, friends. Listen to the clues again. Seth grabbed a coat, boots, and an umbrella before heading outside. Okay, so let's make an inference. What do you already know? What kind of weather do you would there be if you had to grab all those items? <gasps> what? You're so good, friend. Yes, it's raining outside. How did you know that? Of course. Because a raincoat, boots, and umbrella are all used for when it's raining outside. What would happen if you didn't have those things and you would go outside when it's raining? <laughs> yeah, you'd get all wet. No thanks. 
I do not want to be a soggy mess when I go to school. Let's try another one. You did fantastic. Look for the good clues. The cheese was gooey and warm. The sauce was spicy and the crust was so crunchy. Delicious. Okay, friends. I want to know what I'm eating here with this good description. What would be described like this? What do you know that has gooey cheese that's warm, sometimes a spicy sauce, and a crispy, crunchy crust? Oh, this one made me hungry, too. Yeah. Pizza, of course. Yum. I took what I already knew. Lots of things have gooey cheese on them. Like, at first, I thought maybe it was a grilled cheese. But then I thought, oh, sauce. I did well, grilled cheeses don't normally have sauce in it. And then a crunchy crust. Oh, okay. Put them all together, and I know out of all the foods that have those things in it, it's probably going to be pizza. Mmm. Is your tummy rumbling, or is it just mine? That was a delicious inference. Well, friend, you did excellent. Our learning goal said, I can make inferences, and that's exactly what we practiced today. You took the clues from the text, and then you added it to what you already know in your brain. And that is how you make an inference. Okay, it's your turn. I want you to make an inference. I'm going to read this text to you, and then I want you to tell me where is this story taking place. Okay, and then send it to Seesaw for your teacher. Here we go. The lights went dark as the music began. I snuggled down in my seat and stared at the big screen. I popped a piece of popcorn in my mouth and took a sip of my soda. Okay, what do you think the setting is of this story? Where are they in this story? Use the clues from the text and then think about what you already know and then seesaw and let me know. All right, good luck, friend. Okay, so what do you guys think? So the lights went dark and music started. You got comfortable in your seat and you stared at a big screen. Then you popped a piece of popcorn in your mouth and took a sip of soda. Well, taking what I already know and from my personal experience, I would guess they're at a movie theater. So if you guessed movie theater, you are right. All right, guys, good job. Okay, so those were two good videos about making inferences. So you take information from the text, plus what you already know, and from your personal experience to infer about, to make a decision about what you think is going on. Okay, so we are gonna listen to a story. You're gonna look at clues from the text. You're gonna think about what you already know and we are gonna make some inferences. So while the story is playing, I will stop it once in a while and you will help me make inferences from the, the uh, information in the story. Okay, it's called Two Bad Ants. And what we will do as you are listening to the story, I'm gonna come back over here to my board and I have a what I know, information from the text, and what I can infer. So let's get started. Two Bad Ants by Chris Van Alsberg. Genre. An animal fantasy is a story with animal characters that behave like humans. What is unusual about these ants? The news traveled swiftly through the tunnels of the ant world. A scout had returned with a remarkable discovery a beautiful sparkling crystal. When the scout presented the crystal to the ant queen, she took a small bite, then quickly ate the entire thing. She deemed it the most delicious food she had ever tasted. Nothing could make her happier than to have more, much more. The ants understood. They were eager to gather more crystals because the queen was the mother of them all. Her happiness made the whole ant nest a happy place. It was late in the day when they departed. Long shadows stretched over the entrance to the ant kingdom. One by one, the insects climbed out. Following the scout who had made it clear, there were many crystals where the first had been found. But the journey was long and dangerous. So, over here, we could say... Sparkling crystal... And be 
best food. Okay, so from taking a look at the picture, what do we already know? Well, we know that ants like food. And by looking at the picture, I would say I know it's a food. I know it's something that ants really like. And remember, the ants are small. So this is probably a little itty bitty piece too. I would infer that that is sugar because the ants like it. It's a sparkling crystal and they said it was the best food. So I'm going to infer that it is sugar. They marched into the woods that surrounded their underground home. Dusk turned to twilight, twilight to night. The path they followed twisted and turned, every bend leading them deeper into the dark forest. More than once, the line of ants stopped and anxiously listened for the sounds of hungry spiders. But all they heard was the call of crickets echoing through the woods like distant thunder. Dew formed on the leaves above. Without warning, huge cold drops fell on the marching ants. A firefly passed overhead that, for an instant, lit up the woods with a blinding flash of blue-green light. At the edge of the forest stood a mountain. The ants looked up and could not see its peak. It seemed to reach right to the heavens, but they did not stop. Up the side they climbed, higher and higher. The wind whistled through the cracks of the mountain's face. The ants could feel its force bending their delicate antennae. Their legs grew weak as they struggled upward. At last, they reached a ledge and crawled through a narrow tunnel. Okay, so let's look. They talked about, on the page before this, walking through a big forest. Well, we know ants are really teeny. So when you looked at the picture, you could tell it wasn't a big forest. So let's look. So info from the text was that they were walking through. Let's go back and see exactly how they described it. Okay. They described it as a dark forest. So it says they were walking through a dark forest. Well, if you look at the picture, Remember how small ants are, so we know this is the ground. We know how little ants are, so is this really a forest? Are those really trees? Think about how little ants are. So by thinking about how big ants are and what they would be crawling through, we can infer by knowing that ants are really small And looking at the picture, what were they actually walking through? Take another look. Were they actually walking through a forest? Right, I think you are right. I think that they were walking through grass. Good job. They were walking through grass. But they're so small that that grass seems like it could be a big forest. Okay, so let's listen to this again. Higher and higher. 
The wind whistled through the cracks of the mountain's face. The ants could feel its force bending their delicate antennae. Their legs grew weak as they struggled upward. At last, they reached a ledge and crawled through a narrow tunnel. Okay, so if you take a look at this, they talked about that the edge of the forest stood at a mountain. <coughs> Excuse me. So it talks about that they had to walk up a mountain. Well, again, what do we already know? We know how small ants are. And we know when they came to the edge of the forest, they were coming to the edge of the grass. And if we take a look at that picture, take a look at this picture here. And this is a close-up picture of one of the bricks. So is it really a mountain? It seems like a mountain because the ants are so small. But what can we infer? We can infer we know how small the ants are. We can look at the picture and we can infer that they are crawling up a wall. Of a building. We know it's outside because they were already outside and it's made of bricks. Let's keep going. Let's see what happens. It says that they crawled through a narrow tunnel. When the ants came out of the tunnel, they found themselves in a strange world. Smells they had known all their lives, smells of dirt and grass and rotting plants had vanished. There was no more wind, and most puzzling of all, it seemed that the sky was gone. Okay. So they talked about crawling through a tunnel. And when they came out of the tunnel, they found themselves in a strange world. All the smells were gone that they were used to. The dirt, the grass, the rotting plants had vanished. So we can take what they're telling us. So they crawled through a narrow tunnel. And if we look at this, from what we already know, we know how small ants are. We know they were crawling up a wall of a building. And look, they came inside a tunnel. They're so small, they thought it was a tunnel. If you look at this, they came from the outside to the inside because all of the smells that they were used to were gone. They probably came through a what? They came through a window. So again, they crawled through a narrow tunnel. Well, we know ants are small. And by looking at the picture, They crawled through a window. Okay, good job. So if you look at these pictures, you can tell here they, they came to the end of the grass, they went up the wall, they crawled into somebody's window, and you can see in here there's some different things. You can see, looks like there's a little electrical outlet, looks like there might be paper towels. So just by looking at it, and it didn't smell like outside anymore, so now we know they're inside. Let's see what happens now that they're inside. What window did they crawl in? They crossed smooth, shiny surfaces, 
then followed the scout up a glassy, curved wall. They had reached their goal. From the top of the wall they looked below to a sea of crystals. One by one the ants climbed down into the sparkling treasure. Okay, so they crossed smooth, shiny surfaces, then followed the scout up a glassy, curved wall. They had reached their goal from the top of the wall. They looked below to see a sea of crystals. One by one, the ants climbed down into a sparkling treasure. So the shiny, smooth surfaces. So we know that they might be, look at the picture. So they might be in a kitchen. So it tells us crawled across shiny smooth surfaces. So looking at the picture, it looks like a kitchen. And then it also talks about from the top of the wall, they looked below to see a sea of crystals. So if they crawled across shiny smooth surface, they look, looking at the picture, it looks like a kitchen. And also after, I'm gonna add this, after they did cross across the shiny smooth surface, from the top they saw the crystals so knowing that he's there in the kitchen you could probably say they crawled up a sugar bowl remember crawled across shiny smooth surfaces from the top they saw the crystals looking at the picture it looks like a kitchen and then I would infer that they crawled up a sugar bowl okay sorry bowl of course full of sugar all right and it also says they climbed down into the sparkling treasure which means they crawled up the side of the sugar bowl, and now they were crawling down into it. So let's see what happens. Quickly, they each chose a crystal, then turned. We were right. Look, there's the shiny surface. So we know they were like probably on a kitchen counter. This says jar, look at that big jar. And you can see they crawled up it into the crystals, which we have decided was sugar. And they're getting some of the sugar. So let's see what happens. Turn to start the journey home. There was something about this unnatural place that made the ants nervous. In fact, they left in such a hurry that none of them noticed the two small ants who stayed behind. Why go back? One asked the other. This place may not feel like home, but look at all these crystals. You're right, said the other. We can stay here and eat this tasty treasure every day forever. So the two ants ate crystal after crystal until they were too full to move and fell asleep. Daylight came. The sleeping ants were unaware of changes taking place in their newfound home. A giant silver scoop hovered above them, then plunged deep into the crystals. Okay, so if we look at the picture, it talks about a giant silver scoop and remember to the ants it's going to be giant because they're small 
and it plunged deep into the crystals. So if you take a look, so let's go over here. The text says a giant silver scoop plunged into the crystals. Well, what we already know is that we know they're in a kitchen. If we look at the picture, of the silver scoop and we already know the ants were in a sugar bowl or a sugar jar. So let's take a look. So we know they're in the kitchen. We know they were in a sugar jar. We know that there is a giant silver scoop that plunged down into the crystals and it shoveled up the ants and the crystals into the air. Well, from the picture, we can tell, knowing that they're in the kitchen, that that's a spoon. And someone is scooping a spoonful of sugar. Remember, ants are small, so it's probably a human. Scooping a spoonful of sugar. This is all the stuff we're figuring out by looking at the pictures and listening to the words and thinking about what we already know. Because they're not telling us that. They're not telling us that this is a jar of sugar. We figured it out ourselves. We inferred, we made inferences. They're also not telling us this is a spoon. They told us it was a giant silver scoop. And we have to make an inference that somebody is getting a spoonful of sugar from the sugar jar. It shoveled up both ants and crystals and carried them high into the air. The ants were wide awake when the scoop turned, dropping them from a frightening height. They tumbled through space in a shower of crystals and fell into a boiling brown lake. Then the giant scoop stirred violently back and forth. Crushing waves fell over the ants. They paddled hard to keep their tiny heads above water, but the scoop kept spinning the hot brown liquid. Around and around it went, creating a whirlpool that sucked the ants deeper and deeper. They both held their breath and finally bobbed to the surface, gasping for air and spitting mouthfuls of the terrible, bitter water. Then the lake tilted and began to empty into a cave. The ants could hear the rushing water and felt themselves pulled toward the pitch-black hole. Okay, so if we take a look at this, if you look at the picture... Okay, so we can tell that there's the spoon, and when it talks about hot brown liquid, then it talks about bitter water. Well, we can infer that this isn't hot chocolate because it's bitter water. So we can infer that that's coffee, so that's a spoon in the coffee. So it's talking about the lake tilted and began to empty into a cave. So let's look over here. So Miss T wrote, Information from the text. Lake tilted towards a pitch black hole. Okay, and if we're looking at the picture, like I said, you could tell it's a cup of coffee. They talked about the bitter water and the spoon is in the cup of coffee. And then if you take another look at this picture, it talks about it began to empty into a cave. The ants could hear the rushing water and felt themselves pulled towards the pitch black hole. So if you look at this picture, you can tell this is the lake and the tilting is the cup of coffee, right? You can infer that. And the pitch black hole is the person's mouth. So we could say lake tilted towards pitch black hole if we're looking at the picture, we can tell it's a cup of coffee. And so we can infer that someone is drinking a cup of coffee and the ants are getting ready to go in inside their mouth. So hopefully something changes because we don't want to see that happen. Okay, let's finish listening. 
suddenly the cave disappeared and the lake became calm the ants swam to the shore and found that the lake had steep sides they hurried down the walls that held back the lake okay so if we take a look at the picture we've already inferred that it's a cup of coffee here you can see the cup with the handle so when it talks about the walls holding back the lake you can infer that the walls are the sides of the cup of coffee so they crawled up the cup over the side and you can infer that they were crawling down the cup of coffee and you can see in the picture they were going towards the plate the frightened insects looked for a place to hide worried that the giant scoop might shovel them up again close by they found a huge round disc with holes that could neatly hide them but as soon as they had climbed inside their hiding place was lifted tilted and lowered into a dark space okay so if we take a look at the picture and the description is a huge round disc with holes that they could hide in so let's go over here so the information from the test text is huge round disc with holes to hide so if we look at the picture which we just did so we can infer that that big round disc that had holes in it that they could hide in was them hiding in bread okay When the ants climbed out of the holes, they were surrounded by a strange red glow. It seemed to them that every second the temperature was rising. Okay. So, if you take a look, you see that this is bread. We inferred that. And the silver thing it's in, and we know they're in a kitchen, so we can infer that that's a toaster. Because, look, you can see the top of the toaster, and when your bread is pushed down in the toaster, it starts to toast the bread. It gets warm, right? So, we said the huge round disc with holes to hide was the bread. So now, in the text, it says lowered into a dark space, strange red glow, and they were rocketed upward. So, if we look at the picture, well, we know they're bread and they're in a toaster. So, we can infer that the toaster popped and the bread came out. It soon became so unbearably hot that they thought they would soon be cooked. But suddenly, the disc they were standing on rocketed upward, and the two hot ants went flying through the air. They landed near what seemed to be a fountain, a waterfall pouring from a silver tube. Both ants had a powerful thirst and longed to dip their feverish heads into the refreshing water. They quickly climbed along the tube. Okay. So, if you take a look at the picture and think about what you know, you know that they're in a kitchen and they're talking about a fountain and we know fountains have water. They're talking about a silver tube and we've already decided, just like I said, they're in a kitchen. So, if we look down here, Miss T already wrote, in the text, there's a fountain, waterfall pouring, silver tube. So, what do we know? Well, we know that they're in the kitchen, that fountains have water, and by looking at the picture, we can tell that it's a faucet. So they were trying to get water from the faucet. And then, let's see what happens as they're trying to get water from the faucet. And here we can infer that there was a, they were on the faucet in the kitchen sink. As they got closer to the rushing water, the ants felt a cool spray. They tightly gripped the shiny surface of the fountain and slowly leaned their heads into the falling stream. But the force of the water was much too strong. The tiny insects were pulled off the fountain and plunged down into a wet, dark chamber. They landed on half-eaten fruit and other soggy things. Suddenly, the air was filled with loud, frightening sounds. The chamber began to spin. 
Okay, so if you take a look at the picture, we know that they were on the faucet, and when it talks about them being plunged into a wet, dark chamber, well, we can infer that they fell into the drain of the sink. So, let's look. So, the words from the story. Wet, dark chamber landed on half-eaten food. Okay. So, we can assume that they fell off the faucet. And we can infer that they fell into the drain of the sink. Now, when it talks about half-eaten food and the noises that they heard, we could infer that they fell off of the faucet into the drain and that someone had turned on their garbage disposal because all that half-eaten food was swirling around and they heard a frightening noise, which was probably when they turned on the garbage disposal. The ants were caught in a whirling storm of shredded food and stinging rain. Then, just as quickly as it had started, the noise and spinning stopped. Bruised and dizzy, the ants climbed out of the chamber. In daylight once again, they raced through puddles and up a smooth metal wall. In the distance, they saw something comforting. Two long, narrow holes that reminded them of the warmth and safety of their old underground home. They climbed up into the dark openings. But there was no safety inside these holes. A strange force passed through the wet ants. They were stunned senseless and blown out of the holes like bullets from a gun. Okay, so if you take a look at this, we know they're in a kitchen, so they're, they're in the house. And if you take a look at this, your prior knowledge could tell you that this is an, an electrical outlet and that something is plugged into this top electrical outlet. So, what we can write down is that, from the text, two long, narrow holes. And we know they were in the kitchen and they climbed a smooth metal wall. If you look at the pictures, you can tell that it's an electrical outlet. So we can infer that they climbed into an electrical outlet. Now when it talks about strange force stunned and blew them out of the holes, well that happened because they were feeling the electricity. That was the strange force that stunned them and blew them out. And remember they were wet and electricity and water does not mix. So. We know there was a strange force. They were stunned. They were blew, blown out of the holes. They were wet inside an electrical outlet. Those don't work. So we can infer there was electricity and that they got shocked by the electricity. When they landed, the tiny insects were too exhausted to go on. They crawled into a dark corner and fell fast asleep. Night had returned when the battered ants awoke to a familiar sound. The footsteps of their fellow insects returning for more crystals. The two ants slipped quietly to the end of the line. They climbed the glassy wall and once again stood amid the treasure. But this time, they each chose a single crystal and followed their friends home. Okay, so if you take a look at this, you can tell that they are on the kitchen counter. Just by looking at it, you can see the canisters and they were worn out, everything that had happened to them. And then the other ants came along, they went up, like it said, they uh, went up the, um, they climbed the glassy wall and once again stood amid the treasure. So that means they climbed back into the sugar bowl and they decided to pick a single piece of sugar and followed their friends home. So you can see this is where, uh, when, after they came out of the electrical outlet and then they went back into the sugar bowl, got their sugar and followed their friends home. And you can infer that they, that this is them in the grass and that they're headed back to their ant hole. Standing at the edge of their ant hole, the two ants listened to the joyful sounds that came from below. 
They knew how grateful their mother queen would be when they gave her their crystals. At that moment, the two ants felt happier than they'd ever felt before. This was their home. This was their family. This was where they were meant to be. Okay, guys, good job. Well, we did a really good job. We listened to the story and we looked at the clues. Um, they did not specifically say things like spoons and coffee and sugar. But what we had to do was take the descriptions that they gave and think about what we already knew, look at the pictures. The pictures were a big part of the story. Then we were able to infer what was really going on, that the ants crawled across the yard, went into the kitchen, got into the sugar. Two of them decided to stay when they shouldn't have, and they got into some little predicaments like when they were on the bread inside the toaster and then they got shocked in the electrical outlet. So they had some adventures. But you guys did a really good job inferring the different things out of the story. And so this was the lesson for this week. Um, and I will come to you next week with a new lesson. And have a great rest of the week. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.